I'd like you to turn to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. God, touch that precious couple that you sent here. Build them up. Bring them through all their trials, tribulations. Let it be for them as though they got born again all over again, Lord. Let it be for all of us, from glory to glory, from faith to faith. Lord, let the word of the Lord find its mark. Build us all up as the body of Christ. Let us never think, oh, I already know that. So I want to go on. Lord, the most basic things, those are the things that make us or break us, oh God. So I pray you give us teachable spirits. I pray for the newest ones, the ones still struggling, the ones still thrashing about in the waters of life, that they would grab hold of the life preserver that you've sent, that they'd cling to Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation, Lord. This Sunday we heard of deathbed conversions, Lord. In the last seconds of people's lives, they heard of the gospel. You threw them a line, O oh Lord. In the light of eternity, even if we live till we're 90, it's our conversion, still a deathbed conversion and a miracle, O oh Lord God. In the light of the length of time that we shall glorify you forever. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing your praise than when we first begun, O oh Lord God. Father, please let others grab a hold of this life preserver. For we know the time is very short. We know that you're coming. Just as we've heard down through the years, it's exactly right. The Lord comes quickly, O oh Lord. We heard someone pray about being awake or asleep or being virgins with lights. Oh God, wake us up, O oh Lord. Let us trim our lights and fill them with uh, the sweet oil that cannot be exchanged in the day of trouble. We pray for the oil of the Holy Spirit, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> there you are. I dedicated the message to you, brother. By faith. God bless you. God is good. 1 Peter 1, 18. For as much as then as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. He says that you were redeemed not by silver or gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And the greatest um, breakthroughs I've ever made as a Christian have not been by finding out something so far out and so deep and so mysterious. You go down to the bookstore and buy the book, you know, the seventh seal of the secret mystery of the blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's not where the breakthroughs are. I have found that my greatest breakthroughs spiritually have been finding out the simplest definitions of very commonplace things that just permeate Christianity. Like well, something as simple as finding the meaning of the word repent, and then you look at everything different, or finding the meaning of the word righteousness, or you see everything different from then on, or some insight into what it means glory, because isn't glory and repent and righteousness in all our songs, all our prayers, all the psalms, it's from one end of the Bible to the other, and we're so, we, we come, come into the Christian world and we just get baptized in all this, and, and, and we use these expressions sometimes without even really realizing what they mean specifically. And it's always been some specific little definition that has radicalized and changed my Christian life and provoked the growth that I've known. And you know, the Bible says you go from glory to glory, from faith to faith. And, and, and the way I've heard it put by many Christians, and I really believe that this is an example of this, they say, I've been a Christian for 20 years, but it's almost like I've been born again all over again, okay? I actually think that's the way it's supposed to be. You go from glory to glory and from faith to faith. And the expression that I want to talk about tonight is 
this one in this passage. You were redeemed. Now, redeemed is one. I mean, this, this is another subject for another time. But redeemed means you were set free by purchase. Okay. Redemption is so powerful, and it's tied up with this. But what I want to focus on tonight, you redeem not with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain manner of life received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed, verse 19, with the precious blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. The blood of Christ, which God calls precious. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and your hope might be in God. Now, when I first became a Christian, I, I noted that. The Pentecostal church is saying, are you washed in the blood? And I didn't think it was wrong, or I didn't even think it was weird, because I knew these people had something I don't have. I don't understand that. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood? And people would break out and bring glory to God and praise God for the blood of Jesus. The blood was everywhere. And the church was spattered with blood. The blood was in the songs. The blood was in the prayers. There are even people that misuse uh, the expression out of ignorance and superstition. And they say, I plead the blood or put a bloodline around so and so. And something told me I didn't, I didn't bear witness with that. But it was like, like I said, it's everywhere. Sermons, songs, hymns. What is he talking about? What is the blood of Jesus Christ? What's its meaning? Notice in this verse, he says it's precious. Well, who set the value? That's the only thing that makes something precious or not, it's if there's a value on it. Well, who actually says that? Who said it was precious? God did. It's precious to God. It might not be precious to anybody else, but it's precious to God. What is it all about? What's it mean? Look, first of all, the blood is the answer. But even that is ambiguous, isn't it? The answer to what? Well, let's put it this way. It has to do with the power of sin. Would you all agree that sin is so powerful? Sin is way more powerful than people realize because God loves everybody. But only sin, which is not dealt with, has the power to separate a person in spite of God's love forever. You think God brought anyone into existence just so they could be damned forever? Perish the thought. Perish the thought. God brought everyone into existence in hope that they would live with him forever. He never brought anyone into existence just that they might be damned forever. God is love. And what's the problem? Well, when you sin. And isn't that a sad saying, but it's true and it has to be said that way, not if, when. When you sin. It has ramifications in so many dimensions. For example, because God is truth, then when you sin, God himself says, you have sinned. He does. And when you sin, the deep monitor part of your being, if you're still alive anyway, your conscience says, you sinned. And when you sin, in another dimension, the enemy of your soul, He's called the devil. You know what devil means? Accuser. The slanderer, but the problem with him is most of what he says is true. When you sin, he says, you sinned. And you got to have an answer on every dimension if you're going to be okay. You got to have an answer. When God, the Father in heaven, speaks from heaven and says, you have sinned. 
You've got to have an answer. You're going to be called to a council. You've got to have an answer. What's the answer? And when your conscience cries out against you day and night, unless you kill that conscience, which is going to bring you other problems, you got to have an answer. It's got to be a right answer, an answer that you can live with, an answer that you can, uh, that you can be satisfied with in that part of your being. And when the adversary makes his accusation, as Jesus warned us so many centuries ago, agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him. Agree with my adversary. Yep, you're on the way. I'm on the way where? You're on the way to judgment. And the prosecuting attorney is making his accusation. He says, as quick as possible, agree with him. What? Yes. Well, what's the answer? See, first of all, Jesus shed his blood for God, not for us. Jesus shed his blood for God. You can see this in the rituals. The priest of God, one day a year, makes every preparation, slaughters a beast, slips into the holy place and into the holy of holies. And behind closed doors, a transaction is made, blood of an innocent animal that's been sacrificed and sanctified, sprinkled on the very throne of God, the most expensive piece in the whole of the tabernacle and the, and the temple of God is the mercy seat, solid gold, two gold cherubim in between. It covers, it covers the law of God and it covers the pot of manna and it covers Aaron's rod that buds. It was called the Ark of the Testimony, but it was a testimony not for us, but against us. Doesn't the law of God testify against us, if we're honest? Don't the Ten Commandments rise up and point the finger at us and cry out for our death? And doesn't uh, the pot of manna, what does that signify? They took a pot of manna put it in that ark. The pot of manna is God's provision. Did he not provide out in the wilderness? Amen, he provided. What did they do? They grumbled. Why do we have to eat manna all the time? You just take a pot of manna and put it in the ark as a testimony against them. And doesn't uh, Aaron's rod testify? Because if you know the story of Aaron's rod, which would be worth, worthwhile telling someday, uh, they, they rose up against Moses and Aaron and the leadership of God and said, Who made you our leaders? We've got the spirit too. And I've heard that more than once in my odyssey. We got the spirit too. And Moses is spiritual and so were Aaron. So they didn't try and prove that they were the leaders. They said, let's just take this to God. And God said, bring your rods and put them before my presence overnight. Whichever one I appointed, that rod is the one that has the life. And they spread out their rods and Aaron's rod budded and actually had the flowers and the fruit of almonds. Which almonds is a type of the resurrection because it's the first fruit that comes. And he said, put that rod in the ark as a testimony against this rebellious people. And I'm glad that that ark had a lid. The lid was the throne of God. The lid was the mercy seat. And that's what he's called it, the mercy seat. And he said in Leviticus and in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, there I will meet you between the cherubim on the mercy seat. How are we glad that you can meet God in mercy? Now what happens? See, the ark gets captured in battle, which is another story in itself. <laughs> Amazing, astonishing story. Un unbelievable. Ark got captured, and then it comes back after a, quite an odyssey. And then the children of Israel are curious, and they gather around it, and they pick up the lid. And then there's nothing between them and the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod that budded, and the pot of manna, and 40,000 of them are slain right there. Boom! 
wiped them out. Why? Because by lifting up the lid, they were approaching the holy God no longer on the basis of mercy, but just on the basis of truth. Now, I believe in truth, but truth tells me I need mercy. Take away the mercy, the more truth. The blood was shed for God. Jesus shed his blood to satisfy the demands of God against us. Jesus shed his blood because that manna tells God that everything he's provided me and you, we've found a way to murmur against. And that the rebellion that Raren's rod points to is real, a real part of our life. And the law, my goodness, ten witnesses raised against us, calling for our death. And all of these are, God will never deny the truth. God is the God of truth. But I praise you, God, that you're also the God of love. So he instructs this lid. And there was the transaction of blood. There, the blood of Jesus is represented. It's like Passover night. The, God, Moses tells every head of every household, look, you've got to do this. And if you don't do this, your firstborn son is going to die. Because judgment has come to Egypt. And we're just as sinful as they are. So you take this blood animal, you get to know it, and then on the third day you kill it. And you eat it, and you keep the blood, and you make something like the sign of the cross on the outside of the house. Not the inside, the outside. Can't you see that oldest son saying to his dad, are you sure you put that blood on the house? Yes, son, don't worry. I want to see it. You can't see it. You just got to believe in it. What does the blood represent? See, the answer is substitution. Vicarious substitution. Salvation is someone taking our place. If the soul that sins shall surely die, but if I surely die, I will never come back from there. And you either. Not if we surely die. What can I do? What can I do about it? Nothing. But the gospel is, what you could not do about it, God has done. For he has sent a substitute, his son. He came into the world. He took on his shoulders a heavy, heavy yoke of all of the will of God, all of the law of God, all of the covenant of God. He just puts it on his shoulders. And he bears it. He lives a life perfectly pleasing to God. At the prime of his life. 30 years, 33 years old. The very prime of his life. Nobody murdered him. He laid down his life as a sacrifice. And as a priest, he offered his life. He offered his blood to satisfy the perfect requirements of the Holy God. Right? The blood is the answer. Why should a holy God let you into his holy heaven? There's only one answer. You shouldn't. The only reason that I'm going to the holy heaven, even though I'm an unholy person, is Jesus shed his blood. The blood of Jesus is the answer. It's the answer to God. It was shed for God. It was God that looked down and saw the bloody cross and said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. It was God in the closed doors behind the curtain who observed the transaction and says, very good, Israel's sins are covered one more year. It was God and for God, because it was God's law that we broke, and it was God's image that we've shattered, and it was God's holy righteousness that we violated, and therefore it was He Himself who uh, demanded and received. 
See, the blood of Jesus is the offering God made to himself. It's the, all, the rivers of blood, because of the commandment of God, rivers of blood flowed out of the temple for centuries. And of course, that was a God-ordained sacrifice. But they could never take away sin. That's why you had to do them every year. And there's a great, a beautiful prophecy in Psalm 40 where, uh, where the Son speaks to the Father from forever and says, we'll, we'll go to Psalm 40. No, Hebrews 10. Go there. That's a better place because there's other scriptures we can look at there. The blood is the answer to God. And the blood is the answer for our conscience. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, he says, verse 5, Therefore when he comes into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offering and sacrifices for sins you had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written to me, to do thy will, O God. That's the Son from eternity speaking to the Father. He says, I know what you want. He doesn't want the blood of a bull and of a goat and of a sheep. And he doesn't want a provision for a ruined human life. He wants a whole perfectly lived human life in every respect. That's why the baptism of Jesus is such an important thing. This is the only one of whom he could say, this is my beloved son, in him I'm well pleased. And Jesus, from eternity, I get it. I know what you want. And I know that the book's talking about me. And I know you prepared a body for me to go into the world and to do your will. And I love it. I delight to do thy will. Your words in my heart. And so it says, verse 8, when he says, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin you would not, neither had pleasure therein which are offered by law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Once and for all times, you are made holy by that offering. Then every priest stands daily ministering and offering so oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down on the right hand of God. That's another thing too. The Bible says over and over again, he sat down. At the right hand of God. He sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down at the right hand of God. Those priests, when they did those rituals, went in the hole, they could never sit down. Why? Because it was never done. They slip behind the thing, they do their ministration, everyone holds their breath, hoping he comes out alive. And when he comes out alive, one more year, Israel's sins are covered, but they can never sit down because it's never done. This one. After he went to the holy, heavenly holy of holies, he offered his blood to God once and for all. And the sign is huge. And I know you've heard this, but it bears repeating. The, the massive sign to Israel, even the rabbis had to admit it, that the veil in the temple that separated man from the holy presence of God, after Jesus died, that veil was ripped from top to bottom. And the way was open. And the work was done. And there's nothing that we can add to or take away from what Jesus did for us. See, I used to be a Catholic. And every Mass was an offering where we're constantly perpetuating the sacrifice of Christ. But that's an abomination. It's once and for all. Jesus did it. It's the blood is the answer. And I said that... Is the answer for your conscience. See, a lot of people, um, they have conscience problems. Well, 
You, you know, you do certain things, you're going to do some serious damage to your conscience. And that's going to be something that's hard to live with. And you should thank God that you, if you even have a conscience. There are many, and I say this with trembling in this evil generation, there are many who so rendered themselves they can't even blush. They can't even blush. They can't even be mortified by sin. This is a serious thing. Romans 1 warns about it. It's called reprobation. And everyone here of reprobation, you can do such a number on your conscience that you couldn't even have any moral emotions anymore. And if you keep going, you can do it, get it so bad that your conscience is inverted. Now that you've got people that champion evil with a good conscience and hate good. They hate good people. They champion evil. You can see this every day, not in the extremes of society, in the mainstream. The homosexual movement is the new civil rights movement. And anyone that calls for normality is evil. This is called reprobation. You can so render your conscience, you don't have one anymore. If God has mercy, he'll bring that conscience back to life. Paul warned about people who sear their conscience. Paul warns about demons that'll come in the last days and teach teachings. And those teachings, one of the effects of them is they'll kill your conscience. This is a serious thing because we need this conscience, huh? What is a conscience? A conscience is a compound word. Con and science. And if you think about it, what does it mean? Con means with. And science means knowledge. In other words, I have a knowledge right here. And I have a knowledge right here that goes along with it. A deeper knowledge. Now, there are times in my life where I can say up here, I'm all right. But something down here says, no, you're not. And I try as hard as I can to feel good, but I can't make myself feel good because my conscience bears witness against me. There's things I did I wish I never did. And there's things I've seen I wish I'd never seen. And there's things I've said I wish to the Lord that I had never said them. How can I feel good? Because look, Paul told us in another place, Unless you have a good conscience, you can't have faith. See, anything you do against your conscience is going to hurt your faith. It's, people think you can just do anything. And you can go any direction you want because after all, all will be forgiven. True, God forgives. But they don't take into account that not only does sin to be, need to be forgiven, but sin mars the soul. Sin's acid that etches into the soul. It's not just a matter of forgiveness. Who are you going to be after? Maybe you won't even want to run for forgiveness after a point. Because you don't even want to go along with the sham. May the Lord give us a tender conscience, amen? You should keep a good conscience. Paul said, I keep a good conscience. But what if you know something about yourself that's so bad that it just hurts and nags you for the rest of your life? Is there no cure? Is there no remedy for the conscience? I told you, the blood of Jesus is always the answer, not only to God. Of course, it's to God, the answer. I, my God, I believe in your blood. I believe in the blood of the innocent one who took my place in judgment. But the blood of Jesus is the answer for your conscience. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. See, I know something against myself that doesn't allow me to be free anymore. I'm walking with a limp. I'm double-minded. I no longer feel that sense of shalom because something in me testifies against myself. What do I do? Strangle my conscience? There are attempts, serious attempts, to strangle your conscience. 
I'll tell you one that's more common than people think. The way people strangle their conscience is instead of going for Christian counseling, they'll go for psychological counseling because there's no better way to kill your conscience than to give yourself over to the worldly psychologists. They will go right at your conscience. After all, modern psychology was invented by atheists who wanted to supplant Christian counseling anyway. It's an all-out assault on your conscience. It's not a sin. It's an ism. You didn't do it. Your parents did. Oh, man, that'll kill you. That'll destroy your faith. And yet they mix it with Christianity. Now, my problem with conscience is I know something about me and something I've done or said that comes between God and myself. And the only way that I can be cleansed is if I will accept the greater knowledge that tells me something effective and powerful has been done, effective enough to answer for and remove every barrier between me and the Holy God. That's what the blood of Jesus does. Look at verse 14. Verse 13, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, he's talking about for priests. You could be, in a carnal way, you could be made uh, ritually clean by the blood of bulls and goats. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Oh my God, this is good news. Someone has been able to do something so powerful that though there is something that I've done or said that comes between me and God, this man, what he did was so effective and so powerful. He offered himself without spot to God. It tells me that it's removed any barrier between God and myself. Look at 1 John 1. See, a lot of Christians limp around without a conscience, without a good conscience. And it's amazing to me how powerful, irrelevant, and even psychological in the true sense the Bible is. It shouldn't amaze me. He's the author of the human soul. And psychology means the study of the soul. Who knows the soul better than the author of the soul? First John 1. First he says in verse 5, This is the message we heard of him and declared to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So that's the beginning point. It's, it, the Bible's not about us. It's about God and who he is. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now many people cannot function spiritually because of this verse right here. We're saying the games we play to each other and to ourselves. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> They don't have a good conscience. I'm good though. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us. And what it literally says is, from each and every sin. What's he saying? What is walking in the light? It's not living perfectly. Otherwise, you wouldn't need cleansing from sin. Church isn't full of perfect people. Church is full of people, though, willing to remain in the light, willing to be known as they really are, who they are. Nothing more and nothing less real stay in the light 
The blood is the answer to the wounded conscience. The answer to my limp. The answer to this haunting knowledge. Yes, I have done something awful that comes between God and me. It's not to pretend. Look at verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. He talks of self-deception. Just deny that it is sin. There you go. Had a guy that was an adulterer one time called me. He was happy. I said, why? He said, because I just heard on James Dobson that I'm not really an adulterer. I'm a sex addict. Praise the Lord. He's trying to deal with sin by denying that it is sin. Give it a clinical term and it will not cleanse a conscience. So it says, that how do we walk in the light? Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You notice, it's not a matter of feeling. He is faithful. It's a matter of his righteousness. The man who says the same thing about sin that he says, it's a matter of his faithfulness that he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus is the answer to God. The blood of Jesus is the answer even to our conscience. And the blood of Jesus is the answer to the accuser. Look at Revelation 12. It's so much more. The blood of Jesus is the literal object of our faith. Paul says in another place in Romans 3, the ultimate chapter about salvation, that God has set forth Jesus Christ to be the propitiation through faith in his blood. What is it that I really believe? I believe in God. Okay, get more specific. I believe in God, the Son. I believe in Jesus. Get more specific. I believe that Jesus died to give me righteousness with God. I believe in the death of Jesus as the substitute. I believe in the cleansing blood of Jesus as the remover of the barrier between God and I. I believe in the power and sufficiency that what Jesus did was greater than what I did as a sinner and what the whole human race did. I mean, you think of the power of Jesus. You think of the power of Jesus. How many people have ever lived in this world? Right now, there's like seven billion. Look, if everyone was able to be simultaneously alive at one time, what Jesus did was enough to wash away all their sins. The worst person you could imagine, Adolf Hitler, someone like that. Jesus Christ died for their sins. And God says, I'm satisfied with what you did. It's amazing, isn't it? Here's a way to look at it. And I found this very insightful. Our dear friend Paul, who's going to come back from Korea pretty soon with his new wife, praise the Lord, um, told me this one day, and it never left me. He said, really, in the economy of God, there's only been two deeds ever done. There's only one evil thing that was ever done. One act of disobedience. Not zillions. One, they reach out and they pluck the fruit. Someone says, how could that be? How could that be? No, I can tell you a lot more. Oh, yes, but everything else that ever happened came out of that. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 3, by the one act of disobedience, the many were made sinners. Do you believe that? If you really think only one bad thing all of us participated fully in that one sin. There's only one sin, and all of us are fully baptized into it. 
And on the other hand, there's only one good thing that's ever happened. One right thing. One human being did one act of obedience. There's only one obedience. Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he made an offering of his blood. The only good thing that ever happened. Someone said, I can give you a dozen good things. All of them came out of that. If they didn't come out of that, they're not even good. The blood of Jesus is powerful. It says in another place, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. What Jesus did on the cross is greater than what humanity did against God. That's powerful, right? But you've got to have an answer for the devil. Because he's a real factor and a real psychological factor. The devil, the accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12 and the dragon was cast out, verse 9. The dragon was cast out. And what it literally says is that serpent of old. Notice that? This is a little subtle thing. Of old he was a serpent. By now he's a dragon. He's really powerful. Back then was, you could deal with him. called the devil and Satan the devil is not a name the devil is a title it means the accuser the prosecuting attorney he's actually a lawyer he'll bring a case against you where he practices before the bar up in heaven one day he'll be cast out but right now, he's, yeah, he does. He brings, a, he brings accusation to God. And the thing is, is that most of what he says about us, to us, is true. That rotten old Bill Randalls. You know what he did now? Now, when he brings the case to God, we've got a defense attorney. That's what it says, 1 John 2. We have an advocate. That's legal technology, terminology. We got an advocate with the Father. I write these things to you that you sin not. How many are glad he doesn't stop there? <laughs> oh, thank you, God. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. Can I take a side trip and, and define that? This is very, very big. What is a propitiation? A propitiation is a satisfaction offering. In other words, I transgress against you and I got to pay you back. There's got to be something that's valuable. At least it's valuable. It's what I broke. Someone says, I, uh, I walked into your office, Pastor Bill. I noticed your antique Chinese vase worth a million dollars. And I got to confess, I reached out to touch it, and I knocked it over and shattered it into pieces. But don't worry. I saw another one at Target. It looks just like it. You think I'm going to accept that? You know? We broke God's law. We disrupted the peace of God's universe by our sins. You think you can go to Target and find another thing just like it? We broke something we can't replace. We don't have it. But the gospel is that the one person in the universe that does have it, he offered his, his blood. And now he's Jesus the righteous. He's our defense attorney. The serpent accuses us to God, and God looks to Jesus. Jesus, is that true? Did he do that? Yes, he did, but I shed my blood. The problem with us is that Satan doesn't appeal higher. You can't go higher than God. He appeals lower. He'll go to you, you rotten 
Crom, who do you think you are? Are you you saying you're a Christian after you did this, this, and this, and this, and this? And we got to have an answer. It can't be a different answer than the answer of God, but we always look within. Well, I'm doing a little better, or I'm trying, or I didn't do as bad as last week. That's not the answer. The answer is only one. The only answer for God, and the only answer for the conscience, and the only answer for the Satan is the same as the blood. Look what it says, and then I'll close. The dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, that means the enemy, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of this Christ for the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And because they love not their lives unto death. Look, Jesus shed his blood. What about what you say, though? Do you agree with it? And as far as the love of your life, there's nothing good in here. I give up. I'm not looking in here. The answer is not in here. Why should God forgive me? Why should God even answer my prayer? Why should I be able to walk one step with God? The answer is always the same. Jesus shed his blood for me. He's the propitiation. He's the satisfaction offering. When he presented himself to God, God said, now... I'm satisfied. Anyone that comes to me through him, I will treat as though they never sinned. This is the covenant I will make with them, says the Lord. I will write my laws in their hearts and in their spirits. And I will remember their sins and iniquities no more. Wow. How many think that's good news? It's the blood. Paul, John goes right into heaven in the book of Revelation. I don't know if enough people realize that. I mean, Revelation 4 and 5, he goes right into heaven. That's why I like Revelation. It takes you places nowhere else will take you. Right into the throne room of God. Well, what would you think you'd find in the throne room of God? Well, worship. Two songs. Not one, two. The new song. See, the old song, which at one time would have been adequate. And we always sing it, Thou art worthy, worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power. Why? For thou hast created all things. That's the old song. And they sing it in heaven in Revelation 4, right? And that can't do anymore. Because we were created by God. And we do owe him our worship. And we owe him our life just on that point. But that's not enough anymore. Why? We fell. So you press on further into the throne room of God. In Revelation 5, it says... Oh, they sang a new song. What's the new song? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Because he has redeemed us unto God by his blood. And made us a nation of kings and priests. He has redeemed us and shed his blood for us. It's the new song that is now required because of the fall the song of praise the song of redemption the song of the blood of Jesus Father in the name of Jesus build up the faith of your people cleanse the conscience purify the soul let us love you 
because you loved us first. Let us love each other. Even in spite of our sins, let not our consciences be ruined and flawed and diseased and destroyed. Let us not destroy each other. Freely we have received such cleansing. Freely we have received a new life. Freely we give, O Lord. Take the message, Lord, the blood of Jesus. Multiply it and use it, Lord. Infuse the body of Christ with this faith and this cleansing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.